Hi, Hi everybody and welcome to this first research presentation for research session of the third international conference on food design. This is the first food design conference to be 100% virtual and 100% free. A platform from, for anybody, anywhere. Exciting. I'm Dr. Francesca Zampollo. I'm the founder of the Online School of Food Design, and I am very happy to introduce to you these two present research presentations uh, in this first session. Um, but before we start, just a couple of notes. Remember to come in and join us in the live chat room, which you can access by clicking on the green tab on your right. You should, should be over there. Um, Remember, tell us who you are, tell us where you are from, from where you are joining us, tell us what your passion um, that relates to food design is, tell us something about yourself, and most importantly, during the presentation, feel free to ask your questions to the speakers, and at the end, during the Q&A session, I will be reading your questions out loud. Also, once you are inside the chat room, remember to click on those three lines on the very top right, to give yourself a name, otherwise you'll just be guest something, something, something with three, num three numbers. So you remember to go in there. The chat room where we are right now is the chat room called Chat Live Talk, which is exactly the chat room that is um, designed on purpose, purposefully for the live presentation. So come in there and uh, uh, ask your questions oh, and interact. Um, if you're watching this from YouTube, remember to come on over uh, the conference web, uh, web, sorry, conference website at onlineschooloffooddesign.org, uh, where you can participate uh, in the live chat room, participate in the discussion. You can network, and you can have a look at the virtual food design exhibition, which opened today. Okay, so the first presentation is uh, titled. The authors are, and here they are, Beatrice Lerma, Doriana Dalpalu, and Eleonora Bugliatti, and their presentation is titled The Taste of, sorry, The Taste of the Sound or The Sound of the Taste, How Sounding Packaging Influence Food Perception. Our, our second talk will be from Emily Cheng, here she is. Hi. Her title, the title of her pre presentation is Solo Dining. Rethinking Solitary Lifestyle lifestyle of the City Dwellers. Looking forward to that. So, um, I want to remind you to come in the chat room and start, uh, start saying hello and start saying who you are. Remember to give yourself a name by clicking on the three lines on the very top right of the chat room. And uh, I am going to kick off this uh, first research session uh, with um, Beatrice, Eleonora, and Doriana's presentation. And so, Beatrice, Eleonora, and Doriana, this virtual floor is yours. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So, I am Beatrice Lerma. Uh, we call from uh, Torino, from the Polytech di Torino. And uh, we are experts on uh, sensory <laughs> and uh, Doriana in particular is expert about sound design and uh, Eleonora is an um, uh, expert in uh, uh, cognitive ergonomics and uh, cognitive nutrition. So we can start with the presentation. Okay, so uh, this is our presentation, the taste of the sound or the sound of the taste. In fact, uh, today we would like to speak about uh, how sound in packaging can influence, uh, sound, uh, can influence food uh, perception. In fact, food experience today is... Uh, like to speak, speak. Sorry? No problem. Okay, so food experience is uh, influenced by different, uh, especially non-food and uh, beverage factors, depending on the phases of the food consumption and interaction. And uh, for many years, uh, disciplines such as uh, experimental psychology, uh, design, uh, neuroscience and sensory market, 
marketing uh, worked jointly in order to understand the principle which uh, uh, define our food experience. And with the food experience, uh, we mean how, uh, how our pleasure in tasting a meal, a certain meal, is a result of external facts. Uh, for example, of the flatware weight, the lighting, uh, the ambient temperature, or uh, how a dish is named, the sound generated uh, from the act of uh, chewing it, and uh, more. So different are uh, the studies that assume sound to be important regarding the consumer's food taste experience. What the consumer hears uh, between the sound of the food, the sound of the packaging, or the sound of the machine used to prepare the food or the beverage, the sound of the environment have um, a consequence on our flavor perception. And for example, the image of the dish uh, in which food is served uh, on people's perception has not been studied empirically. But the sound generated by people biting a dry food, for example, a potato chip, can contribute more than 15% uh, to the perception of uh, freshness or crispness. And during the food experience, uh, different are the factors that can influence our food perception. And so the sounds uh, that we saw before can uh, be uh, catalogued in four different categories. So we can have uh, anticipatory sounds, for example, uh, the product name or uh, the food processing sound. And then we can have a prime coincident sound. So the first bites or late coincident sounds, for example, the mastication sound, the flatware sounds, or post prandial sounds, for example, the sounds uh, produced clearing the table. Okay, so in order to understand how sound in packaging can influence perception, we can read out uh, a yogurt containing three different packaging. Participants ask the, to describe yogurt referring to specific aspects. Someone mainly regarding its taste, so the sweetness and the, the sourness, Others concerning mouthfeel perception, the tastiness, the thickness, and the calorificness, and the others related to the quality of the yogurt, so its uh, artisanality, expensiveness, and uh, genuineness. And the aim of this test was to understand how the properties of a food packaging uh, may affect the how the food is experienced during uh, consumption. And we selected three uh, widely commercialized yogurt packaging has the case studies. And uh, within the yogurt packaging hyper choice, we selected three containers characterized by a similar meta shape uh, in order to reduce uh, the possible the pot shapes on the test. The containers are in different materials. So we have a glass pot, a clay pot, and a polypropylene pot and uh, um, we used a standard quantity of uh, strawberry yogurt that was served at the same uh, temperature in each pot. So since the objective was to uh, investigate the relation between perceived sounds and food qualities, other sensory stimuli such as sight and touch were avoided and therefore during the test uh, the pot, each pot was uh, hidden in an identical cardboard box. Uh, 30 subjects mixed between males and females uh, took part at the test, 
all the participants were Italian and uh, at the recruitment stage uh, we um, didn't give any information about the specific aim of the study and of the test and the participants were mixed between experts and uh, naives uh, in order to verify um, whether the background knowledge affects on subject perception of food in relation to packaging sounds. So before starting the test, uh, subjects were asked uh, to prefer them to prepare themselves to taste uh, to the taste by eating a piece of water cracker and drinking a sip of natural water. And during the test, each uh, participant was asked to collect from the blind box a spoon of yogurt and taste it. And uh, touching the packaging box was not allowed and uh, subjects produced some noises with the spoon uh, to the packaging sides to collect the yogurt. So after uh, the stimulus, we asked uh, to fill a questionnaires and we asked the subject to evaluate on a one to nine point scales uh, the tested food on the items presented in uh, random order and uh, uh, the items are uh, here in the slide. So this uh, um, test was repeated under the three different conditions. In other words, uh, taking the yogurt sample from which one on the, of the three blind packaging, glass, clay and polypropylene. All the results of uh, the qualitative questionnaires were uh, collected in a data matrix and the results were calculated and uh, represented by um, descriptive uh, statistics in a semantic differential scheme. We carried out, in fact, a first qualitative analysis on the variation of the perceived attributes of yogurt in relation with the different packaging materials. Here uh, you can see the first semantic differential scheme developed to compare the mean values of each attribute for each packaging. Uh, the slide uh, shows that referring to food quality, polypropylene sounds makes the food product being perceived as cheaper and less artisanal than the other materials. Um, referring to mouthfeel, clay sound affects on thickness perception of food and also um, calorific perception increases with clay sounding materials. Referring to perceived taste, uh, the food seems to be perceived and less sour if containing a polypropylene sounding packaging and sweeter if contained in a glass sounding um, packaging. Here, uh, in this picture, we can see the further analysis of the effect due to participants' related variables on the collected data, such as sex and expertise. And a significant difference was found for sex variable on the attribute of sweetness and genuineness, and female participants perceived yogurts as less sweet and less genuine than male participants. Moreover, we found a significant difference for expertise variable on the attributes of sweetness and uh, calorificness. In fact, experts perceived the yogurt as a sweeter and uh, more calorific than uh, naive participants. So after this test, uh, we can state that uh, a producer interested in increasing the perceived quality of uh, his dessert may select a clay sounding packaging in order to make perceive the product uh, the product as more uh, genuine artisanal thick uh, calorific and also expensive and we can also hypothesize that perception of genuineness and artisanality arised in relation to sound of spoon rubbing against the clay and here we have the sound of the clay packaging
on the contrary uh, producer interested a producer interested in improving the perceived thickness of a product may not only act on the packaging weight but also on the nature of the material packaging and for example in order to increase the perception of uh, tastiness uh, polypropylene could be used uh, even if these materials uh, was proved making uh, uh, perceive a product as cheaper and instead in order to um, positively affect on uh, sweetness and uh, artisanality perception glass uh, can be used and here we have the sound of uh, polypropylene sorry the sound of uh, polypropylene and the sound of glass And then to conclude, this study demonstrates how sounding packaging can be adopted as a communication channel for information that uh, are linked not only to taste and uh, mouthfeel perception of food, but also to its uh, uh, nutritional properties. And uh, moreover, the material selection for packaging can depend uh, in future no more only on well-known aspects uh, such as uh, shapes uh, or color or weight, but also on sound requirement. And so for these reasons, we can recommend uh, new uh, continuous relations between uh, three disciplines, uh, design, cognitive nutrition, and sensory marketing. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, guys. I'm going to put back to your um to you uh, thank you for this lovely presentation thank you very much we're going to jump to emily um very quickly and then we go for the question and answers um before i get there i see uh, that there's a lot of people in the chat room which makes me very very excited um but it seems like maybe some of you um are not in the actual live chat room. So it seems like a lot of you are connected to the chat, but are not in the live chat room where we are at the moment. So just remember to click on the chat that is called chat live talk. That is where we are, and that is where you can ask your questions to the speakers. And by the way, you can uh, start anytime to ask your questions. And so when it's time for Q&A, I will be collecting them and reading them out loud. Okay. I'm going to jump over to our second presenters. Thank you again, uh, Beatrice, uh, Eleonora, and uh, Doriana. And um, yeah, thank you again. And we'll jump to Emily for now. Thank you. Emily, uh, again, your presentation is called Solo Dining, Rethinking Solitary Lifestyle for City Dwellers. These virtual floors is yours. All right. So hi, everyone. Thank you very much for having me. My name is Emily, and I'm currently studying at Royal College of Art. Um, yep, you are there. OK. So I hope you're just as excited as I am and get some inspiration out of today's event. So today, I'll be sharing a research on solo dining. Before we start, I'd like to give you a little bit of background about who I am and what I do. I'm a service and experience designer with a background in visual communication design. So I've worked on projects ranging from visual, branding, packaging, exhibition, and to more recently designing services. So I took on a journey looking at how one of our most important services of the day, eating, is being designed. And today I'll be covering three parts from the rise of solo economy to my solo dining experiment, and then with global future trends for food services. So talking about solo dining, I'd like to start with a question. What does solo mean? And there are two different points of views, solitary and lonely. And the main difference is perhaps the state of mind. Being solitary doesn't mean that one is disappointed without companion, whereas being lonely has a sense of lacking emotionally. In Olivia Leung's latest book, the Lonely City, she further pointed out that not everyone living individually is lonely. And perhaps people may possibly even experience lonesome while surrounded by people. 
Um, and the psychologist, uh, sorry, the psychologist also refers it as the social isolation. So I got interested in the topic of solo, perhaps from my own personal lifestyle living in different cities. The fast paced city is the excitement that keeps me going on every single day. But sometimes I get really frustrated and I just need time to be with myself. So the idea of solo becomes really attractive. I found myself connecting with the city through sensory journey, discovering neighborhoods by trying out different restaurants. However, it's often hard to arrange time to eat with other people. So sometimes I would just go by myself. And it turns out that more people are like me just than you think. So from a society's perspective, single households are rising. According to Office for National Statistics, one in fourth of the population in the UK lives alone. And that's more than half of the Londoners live by themselves. Solitary is no longer perceived as atypical, but has become the common phenomenon. More people that embrace and sometimes even yearn for. The famous Japanese organizational theorist Kenichi Ome referred to the social trend towards solitary lifestyle as solo economy. People are now more willing to spend um, on quality tickets for themselves. And among many social demographics targeted by the retailers and service providers, the solo consumer is one of the most powerful yet overlooked. Let's take into more in-depth examination of the food service sector. According to BBC, 27% of TV people eat alone nowadays, and the big lunch surveyed 2,000 UK adults, and over one third of them eat without any companions for a whole week. Can you imagine that, just a whole week without eating with anyone? And in 2015, Open Table showed that there is a 110% rise in bookings for one over the past 24 months, making them one of the fastest growing reservation party size. And it's not about casual takeaways. Instead, it's the full service restaurants that people make the effort to book in advance. It indicates that there are needs that takeaways cannot provide and there is opportunities for full service restaurants to provide a better out of home dining solution, even when people are eating by themselves. And this led me to questioning, what makes a good solo dining restaurant? Eating alone has become such a natural thing that many of us are doing it even without noticing. Has eating alone become the new norm? While there is increasing demand for solo diners, the food service industry is not exactly solo dining friendly. The impression of eating represented by the mass media is relatively biased. Just take a look at the homepage of Open Table. It shows a group of friends eating happily together, but how would that affect the solo diners when they're booking for themselves, especially if they're one of the fast growing customer groups on Open Table's platform? Many people would rather just order deliveries or takeouts than endure the stigma of associated with table for one, leading to the increasing popularity for delivering services, such as Deliveroo, Uber Eats, and so on. Single portion ready meals also play a big role, contributing to 16.9 billion revenue in the UK market. And at Waitrose, meal for one is 80% of sales for the entire ready meals range. Recently, an ad campaign by the online restaurant booking service, Book a Table, encourages Londoners to step out of their house and encourage them to explore the cities with different kinds of food. The global restaurant consultant, Aaron Allen, has also brought attention to food services, the importance of the solo dining demographic. Some restaurants have been adapting to the trends by providing smaller sampling menus, arranging open kitchen, communal tables, and implementing Wi-Fi and charging station, also training their staffs to help single diners to feel more at ease. Unfortunately, it seems like the solo dining um, customers do not really actually appreciate it. According to Zagat National Dining Survey, communal table is actually one of the top two deal breakers. So now you kind of get the landscape of the whole solo dining scene. Let's move on to the exciting part where I experienced firsthand of what's happening in the real situations. I was keen on finding out whether the experience was really that bad 
or how might things have been done differently? So before I began, I listed some guidelines. Since lunchtime is often quite common for people to eat alone, I focus on dinner time and removing mobile devices so I could really immerse myself into the environment, as well as observing if any possible interventions could be made by the restaurant services. I documented the whole process with GoPro camera by just simply setting right in front of me to get a first person perspective on the experience. There is also a blog post, which you can feel free to check it out after the conference. The way that I selected the restaurants were also strategically planned. I cross-examined 10 lists of recommendations for solo diners and selected 10 restaurants that showed up most frequently based on the price range indicated on timeout, which is also one of the popular sources for people to look for restaurants. I selected a total of six different restaurants from two from each price range, low, medium, and high. In this experiment, cafes and takeaways and chain stores are not in consideration, as they are similar to fast food chains with casual vibes, which doesn't really give people much stress when eating alone. And as you can see, these are the six final restaurants that I have selected, Kanadaya, Princi, Flexin, Buca di Lupo, um, Barfina, and the Palomar. To visualize and compare between my experiences, I have incorporated one of the most common tools that we use in service design, journey mapping, and to really identify the highs and lows of my experience. As you may see, the waiting time after ordering food tends to be the lowest point. The only two that went up were at the Palomar, which I had a great view of watching the chefs cooking, and also Blexin, which the waitress kindly offered me some newspaper to read and kill time. The radar charts here also shows individual factors that influence the experience. Based on my observation and casual conversation with in-store customers and staffs, I've identified five crucial factors um, that would influence the solo dining experience. So from time, price, interaction, comfort level, and food quality. From my experiences, I have concluded five key insights which I will go through them one by one individually more in detail. First, communal tables are ideal to bring people together, but in reality, eating can be quite a private and messy moment. So while I was eating ramen at Kanadaya, I was being seated at a communal table with seven other strangers who were actually friends with each other. And I was, not, I was the only one who was not a part of their conversation and I felt like waiting for the food was the longest five minutes of my entire life. While I was eating, I also felt that I couldn't help but overhear their conversations, making me feel that I was the outsider and trespassing their privacy. Although Open Kitchen is one of the most popular mentioned features reading on the reviews for solo dining friendly restaurants, it may not be the case. Three of the restaurants in my experiment have Open kitchen, open kitchen setting. However, the difference really lies between whether the customers are fully engaged with the interactions or are they just bystanders. For example, at Buca di Lupo, the picture in the middle, I was the only customer at the bar and was seated close to the wait staffs who are distributing the dishes. They were all chatting in Italian and obviously I had no idea what they were talking about. I felt a bit awkward and thinking that they might be talking something about me. I know I'm probably overthinking, but I just can't help but being very self-conscious. This is also referred to a psychology phenomenon called spotlight theory, where you think people are talking about you, but they really aren't. The third key insight is that interactions with the wait staffs needs to be meaningful. And it's not about the numbers or the frequency, but more about compassion. So like I mentioned earlier, while I was eating at Blexin, one of the waitress noticed that I was wandering around, perhaps maybe showing a bit of anxiety since I didn't have my phone with me. She kindly offered a newspaper for me to read, and it made me felt like I was being looked after despite I was eating by myself. One of the biggest challenges when dining alone is that your eyes are more often hungry than your stomach. So when I visited the Palomar, 
the waiter suggested that I get one main and two and three sides. It turned out that I can't even finish them. And what's even worse is that later on, I saw another single diner next to me who had smaller portions, and these small details can't, these were not indicated on the menus nor mentioned by the wait staff when I was ordering. But these small details can really make a difference to the whole dining experience. I've also noticed that I have better table manners when dining alone in public. The social expectations has influenced me to behave in certain manners in public. At home, I would probably just stuff the entire piece of lettuce since no one really cares and no one's watching. But when I'm eating outside, I would make sure to make the effort to cut the food into smaller pieces. And it also adds in health benefits since I'm eating much slowly. Moving on to the last section of today's presentation, I'd like to share a few case studies catering towards the emerging solo dining groups. With half of our meals consumed alone on a weekly basis, I believe there will be increasing demand as well as business interest in this area. So in Korea, there is a dedicated term for people eating alone called hanbap. And as I mentioned earlier, having a nutritional balanced meal without over ordering can be quite a challenge. So with Shabu Shabu, the restaurants have catered the needs and developed menus that include well variety and suitable portion size. The second example is Ainmel in Amsterdam. It's the first one person experience um, restaurant in the whole world. All table sizes are specifically designed to fit one person and they offer newspaper and books instead of Wi-Fi. It's a great getaway for people who want to treat themselves for a moment of peacefulness. Following the theme on single seating, Ichiran Ramen in Japan is also a great concept where customers are seated in individual booths and order from the vending machine. Throughout the entire process, the diners will not even have to see any wait staffs nor other customers. And the noodles will be served from the curtain right in front of you. This caters the issue of weird and uncomfortable perception of one being alone, yet dealt with the eating privacy issue. The next one might seem a little bit absurd to some of you, the Moomin Cafe, where you eat with a giant stuffed animal sitting right across from you to keep you company. Or you could prefer to have real people to keep you company. Um, eat With is one of the San Francisco startup, now expanded globally, allows travelers to dine with local hosts to socialize over the meal. The opportunities are endless, and this is just the beginning. As I mentioned earlier, one out of fourth of UK population are living alone and single households are rising globally. How can we design the needs for this group of audience is really important. By looking through the lens of solo dining, this is just the tip of an iceberg, bringing attention to the overlooked population. What's more, Potential opportunities can also be expanded into many other sectors from healthcare, transportation, financial, and so forth. And as designers, I firmly believe that it is our role in design to transform into the future. But fundamentally, I'd like to ask all of you a question. Do we really want to live a solitary lifestyle? And before we end, I'd just like to give a shout out to the video that I did for my solo dining experience. Um, since the conference, is, sometimes the Wi-Fi may not be um, as fluid. So I really encourage you to go check it out from the link below and have a look at the blog to see if you have discovered any hidden signs from the video. In the end, if you have any interesting solo dining experiences, questions, or simply want to chat more, Feel free to get in touch, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for your lovely presentation. Uh, let me just click things here. Um, OK, wonderful. Now it's your time, guys. It's time for questions and uh, answers. So uh, we need questions to start with. <laughs> so um, join the chat room that is called Chat Live Talk and ask anything you guys you want. And I was uh, looking through the chat room before, and I 
uh, can't help but notice that it's just beautiful to see um, so many people from so many different uh, places. Um, we have Olga from Siberia and, uh, and uh, Colombia living in Milan, someone else from they don't say where, and the uh, all sorts of flags and flags that I've never seen before as well are here, which is just beautiful. Just uh, US, a, a few people from uh, Italy, uh, Uruguay, Budapest, uh, Mumbai, Tokyo, Paris, wow, Mexico. Uh, Germany, Berlin, Stockholm, uh, Spain, we said Spain, wow, Netherlands, fantastic, I love this, I really love this, I love the internet, so I love this, <laughs> okay, uh, in the meantime, okay, we have somebody, um, no, oh yes, um, okay, uh, I think it's a question for Emily. Yes. Um, for our, oh no, sorry. <laughs> for our first presenters, I am so fascinated by some of the gender differences you observed in your experiment. Could you share more on your findings and thoughts on how gender affects the food sensory experience and design? Thank you very much for this question. I think this is, ah, oh yeah, it is. It's Emily Contois asking this question, who is one of the speakers. Uh, I'm she's speaking, so I can tell you. Moving. What time are you speaking, Emily? Remind me. She's speaking at na, sorry, 8 p.m. this evening. So thank you for connecting already and thank you for your question. So uh, Beatrice, Leonardo and Doriana, I'm putting you up and I'm giving you the stage to answer this lovely question. Yes, actually we did this, um, this analysis in order to verify if, um, if um, how can we say, Mm, participants' mm, variables could affect this, uh, this question that we submitted to, the, to our panel. Um, we tried to, to make this uh, further investigation on variables such as uh, sex and uh, on expertise level, but also on, um, uh, on the, 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 if they used to smoke, or if they, or on these variables. And we found that um, with our, um, we can say quite small um, sample of people that we, we interviewed, um, we found this difference uh, in related to sex variable. Um, specifically, we found that um, a quite Mm, interesting difference in genuineness perception was uh, was uh, yes arose from this uh, from this study, and um, of course this uh, is a, an interesting finding. We thought that uh, we could um, better investigate this uh, this uh, aspect also in future studies. Uh, for the present time, we can um, discuss this uh, this finding also. Uh, linking this, uh, this finding with other um, evidences uh, presented in literature. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. because, uh, for example, for uh, smell sense, uh, we can uh, assist uh, to some uh, differences uh, um, from uh, male and female. Uh, and so uh, we, we took the same... Um, uh, the same um, analysis, analysis uh, for for taste too, mm -hmm. um, and so to, to, to verify if uh, for for taste uh, uh, it was uh, the same. Mm -hmm. yeah. And for concerning the expertise level, we thought that it was interesting to verify also in this case if the sweetness and calorificness perception um, could vary. Uh, depending on the um, the level of expertise of our panel, and we 
we found that also in this case we had uh, differences between experts and naive participants and um, from a, an applicative point of view we can say that um, producers could reflect on this uh, on this finding and also uh, in some way um, take into consideration also this aspect when uh, when uh, designing uh, for example the the product um, taste acting for example on uh, more sweetened or less sweetened products depending on uh, their public on their their target um, so for this reason we we thought that it was uh, interesting to verify also this aspect even if it was not the main point of our of our study nevertheless we would like to investigate it more better in a, in a further in deep, deeper in further studies <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you so much. I think um, you just explained, and your presentation is really one of the, uh, I think, uh, biggest examples to me of the reason why I think conferences like, like these, uh, or conferences in general probably, uh, are important and necessary. Um, here we have from you guys uh, relatively simple, let's say, applicable uh, data and findings that can be used tomorrow. And here we have in our chat room, chat room and around the world, the people connecting, um, designers, chefs connecting that are, that will be able to use your findings. So I just wanted to point out how, um, how, how I think uh, it is important, why I think it's important to do events like this that bring together both researchers, research and the, and the practice, practitioners. Um, so thank you for this, th thank you guys for this, for this presentation, absolutely. It was, um, it's very, um, um, it's, it's, it's always beautiful to see uh, the research and data that you, can, that you understand and that are applicable and usable in a way tomorrow. I wanted to ask you, um, related to, again, um, related to what you just said, um, what, what is the, you, were, you just, I think you touched on it briefly, but um, what are your plans for future, for future research? I, I imagine that now you're already working on something uh, else. Um, so how are you actually, what are, you, what are the next steps of this research? Um, for example, uh, we can um, focalize uh, our attention um, on the context of uh, wellness and health because uh, we know that uh, some sensory stimuli like for example the chromatism of a plate or of a bowl can make food uh, really um, significantly uh, taste sweeter or saltier for example so for example color red is typically associated with the sweetness uh, while blue uh, with saltness uh, and green with sour so um, we can work uh, in a context uh, um, concerning health for example in the british hospitals patients uh, requiring particular diets are served food in red try so that they can perceive uh, them as healthier dishes so we can uh, pay attention on uh, um, uh, arguments uh, that are more uh, ethically ethical i'm sorry yeah it makes a lot of sense um in, with regards to this this research specifically um correct me if i understood if i haven't understood uh, exactly you have worked with um, uh, plastic uh, glass and um, clay. clay clay that's it yes for now do you, for are now. you planning to add that other materials why not why not and maybe also <laughs> another another packaging uh, shape mm -hmm. yeah. and other uh, other size uh, other weight right yes 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 um thank you that makes a lot of sense um this is uh what i what i i, I think i have another question but maybe i'll leave it for later i want to jump to emily now we have mm -hmm. a question from carlos um uh, um this is for emily um I think what he says that he thinks that eating alone 
he he agrees on the fact that eating alone is a, is a, in, a, not always a positive experience mm -hmm. uh, and he found the presentation very interesting uh, this reminds me that for almost everyone cook it at home uh, for ourselves um, mm -hmm. it's also unthinkable do you think cooking for yourself at home and uh, having dinner out alone could be related and I, I will add to this question also, uh, how do you think your research is applicable to eating at home? Okay, um, so Carlos, thank you for the question. And I think eating alone outside versus at home is actually quite different experiences. So when you're eating outside, it's not, you're actually, you're actually not really eating alone because there's also other interactions that you have with people around you. For example, the wait staffs or even the customers next to you. And um, when you're cooking at home, I think one of the main things that we would need to consider currently is that um, the packaging size. So sometimes when you um, buy things and then you open it, but you don't immediately use it up, it causes a lot of food waste or people sometimes tend to overcook and in the end they just throw everything away. So I think the experiences okay, of eating eat, like me. public or um, at home is quite different. Okay, and um, sorry, did I interrupt you? Were you? Oh, no, no, no. I okay. Think, yeah. Um, so how do you think your, do you, do you, do you see yourself continuing this research to uh, the, the private environment at some point? Um, I think I'm still more interested in the public um, because I think there's still kind of like the stigma going on but I think eventually maybe I could um, also go in into like eating at home and things like that but at the moment because there is already a lot to do within the public space whether it's from the space or from the human interaction or just even the whole experience of how the food is being served. There's a lot of research that could go into that. But um, as me and Francesca were earlier talking, I think it would be really cool if we could like have a whole kind of like a movement of people documenting their own solo dining experiences. And in the end, like we could all share that on the web. I think that would be a great experience as well. Yeah, you should definitely set that up <laughs> because uh, it's be and, and this is something that I wanted to bring people attention on. Um, the video that, that Emily is making videos, I think, right? More than one. You made a few? Yeah, right? I made a few. That yeah. Emily is making of her solo dining experiences are just beautiful to look at. And uh, one of them is just uh, below. Uh, if you just scroll down on the conference webpage, if you're watching this from the conference website, um, you just scroll down and there you have um, one of her videos. And uh, they're just beautiful, beautiful to see, but it's so interesting to see. I think this one, what is it, like six minutes or something? Yeah, it's of course six minutes. Five lives. It's a time lapse, but um, it's beautiful to see and uh, to it's beautiful to look at other people's reaction and what they do and the waiters and what you do while you are waiting. Um, yes. The perspective also, the, the camera view that you chose is also, uh, I think, quite interesting. Uh, so I definitely think that you should start a movement. You should start the website where everyone tweet can. Me, tweet me if you're interested in joining and then we'll start like a whole platform. <laughs> I'd be really interested in that. Absolutely. Um, one question that I wanted to ask you, how do you see, um, like, can you give examples of how you see your research being uh, used to design um, f uh, different aspects of the eating experience and therefore uh, from the different uh, food design subdisciplines? So, for example, how do you see your data being used to design the eating environment or the eating mm -hmm. utensils or um, uh, maybe the dishes themselves if you want and of course the management control system or uh, in other words what the service staff does and what other yes. people do um, so I think the research why I came up with um, so I've actually shared it with uh, several restaurants already um, while I was just like eating at some restaurants their store managers were actually really interested in the research and I think right now even though there might not be like a 
dedicated role as a food service consultant, but I believe this will be a trend that in the end that restaurants that they or even like food retailers will like to engage with. Um, and I think from a service perspective, I think designing the whole experience rather than just focusing on the dishes itself is really important. And maybe it could be even linked with like the sensory designs that the previous um, talked about. So, you know, how do you form this whole dining experience from a sensory perspective? Because obviously we're not just eating with our mouths, but it's also with the things that we hear or the things we smell. Um, so I believe there's like a whole opportunity that many of us could explore furthermore as designers. Definitely, I agree. And this is the this is food design, the role of the food. How do you say? How do you call it? Food cons, food service consultant. Where is the food designer? So, let's bring awareness out there so that more and more uh, food designers have uh, possible employment. Because every restaurant, every food company should have a food design consultant at some point. Yes. Um, we well, you have another question from Terry from London, so a neighbor of yours. <laughs> uh, thank you for your great presentation. I have a question for Emily. What makes, what made you think about the topic of solo dining, and what do you see? Sorry, and and what do you see it with food design? I think how do you think it? How do you see it relates to food design? I guess I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as I said in the presentation, I got interested in the idea of solo because I constantly move around the different parts of the world. So a lot of times I'm actually by myself. Um, how I see it linking with food, I think obviously the food is the medium that um, the whole focus of this project. So I think anything related to food and I think also like everything in our life every day is design related that we might not even notice, but everything is carefully designed by people. So that's how I see their integration together. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask the same question to uh, Beatrice, um, um, Eleonora and, Dor and Doriana, really. Where did the idea of this research come from? Uh, I mean, you are, you are deep into the world of materials, so I might it might be just something just natural for you to kind of get there. But for us, uh, I think it's interesting to know what was the path that brought you to ask this research question. And this relates to this sub kind of sub question. What do you, th what you, th what did you think was the need um, for this research? Why do we need this data? Mm. Okay. So, okay, we, we started to, we started to uh, research about, uh, course materials and you said before and uh, its sensorial qualities so we tried to describe the material from uh, the sensory point of view and so we have to consider also the sound uh, uh, requirements of um, uh, in a product uh, uh, design process and for this uh, reason we tested uh, materials, packaging, and also food, considering uh, these uh, requirements, so the sound requirements. And uh, as we said during the presentation, uh, sound in packaging, but also sound in materials can uh, affect the perception of a product, of a food. Uh, we can say that uh, the sound of a product can affect the uh, whole um, product uh, experience. Yes, we also thought that we basically we were investigating um, the sounding qualities of materials and we thought that this could represent also an opportunity for practitioners, as we said before, um, to improve the um, the, the, the global user experience of a food product also um, acting on this uh, on the, the sounding on the sound aspect of uh, a food or of uh, a packaging for example and so for this reason we we tried to investigate this aspect through this uh, this, uh, this study 
Brilliant. Thank you so much. I'm just uh, replying to somebody in the chat room. Uh, no, Adrian, we are uh, asking, you can, it's, you can ask questions to uh, both the presenters. Um, oh, yeah, sorry, the 1 p.m. and 1.15 p.m. Yes, you're right. Uh, you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. Okay, so guys, any other question from the audience? This is your moment. Um, otherwise, I think that it's uh, two fifty-six. No, sorry, it's one fifty-six p.m. GMT plus one. Uh, it's two fifty-six <laughs> for me. Uh, so I think uh, we have kept the audience uh, uh, enough, long enough, or almost an hour, which is great. Uh, thank you, guys, for your uh, again, uh, uh, guys, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, thank you, um, Eleonora. Uh, Doriana and, uh, and Beatrice and Emily for your presentations. I found them both very um, inspiring, but most of all, I found them useful. And I think this is good. <laughs> <laughs> this is a very good thing. I found them very, very useful. Uh, like I can take something home from, from what you taught me. Uh, and I think <laughs> so uh, can all our um, uh, guests in, in, the, in the audience, which I, who I see uh, were all very uh, pleased uh, from, uh, pleased um, by your, uh, by your uh, talks so thank you very much i want to thank you uh, thank you for the last time everybody who attended this uh, session live and uh, uh, so thank, thank thanks again to all of you um if you saw only part of this or uh, uh, and, and you want to see the whole thing don't worry because every live presentation is recorded and will be uploaded almost immediately give me like 10 minutes in the conference website and you will be able to see um the the whole presentation again whenever you want um that's it i will see all of you at let me see I will see you all for session two at 3.30 p.m. GMT plus one. For our se second session, it will be a practice session. We have two more presentations in, in this uh, second session. And uh, again, thanks again to our presenters. You have been very, you. you've been Thank lovely. You. And, uh, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a lovely okay. day and happy food design. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.